I won't forget the wonder how you brought deliverance or the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I won't forget the wonders how you brought deliverance or oh, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. A cloud by day, a sign that you are with me. Yeah. The fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, sing it again. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand, and you marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Yeah, this is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. Oh, you stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, man. into my Egypt, you took me by the hand, and you marched me out in freedom, into the promised land, 
Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. Oh, you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Yeah, this swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. your foe, still your love fought for me, you have been so, so good to me, I was felt no worth, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so kind to me. You won't climb up coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. Thank you, Lord. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. You won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. 
big old climber coming after me. No wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. He leaves a nine and nine. Oh, I couldn't earn it. And I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful God never gave up. Amen. God never stopped chasing me. Amen. And I look at my past and I, God chased me into some ugly places. Amen. And I'm sure you, a lot of you have the same story. We took God into some ugly places. God, forgive us, Lord. But thank you, God, for not giving up, Lord God. Thank you for following us into those dark Amen. places, Lord God, and protecting us even while we were in sin, Father God. God, we love you, Lord. We love you. Darkness, my God, 
that is who you are. Woo, come on, a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You're more real than the ground I'm standing on. You're more real than the wind in my lungs. Your love defines me. You're inside me, you're my, my reality. You're more real. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, you're more real than the ground I you're more real than the wind in my love. Yes, you are. Your thoughts define me. Is your inside me? Your Your 
cause divine me You're inside me You're mine My reality Oh, yes you are Abba praise tonight. Hallelujah. Ushers, get ready as we continue worshiping our giving tonight. I don't know about you, but I've gone to a lot of restaurants. I think that meal tonight exceeds some Come restaurants I've real. been at. That's real. That's Amen. Real. Amen. Thank God for this ministry. Father, we just love you. We praise you for all the provisions that you've made in this ministry. Yes, Father. From the very thing that we can feed the men every time, more importantly to the point that we can feed them your word you, every night when we come together. And I just thank you for that, Lord. Bless this offering now. Let it be for its intended use. We give it glory and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful tonight, men, that I am a product of God's love. Come on now. Somebody hear what I'm saying tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm a product of God's love. Amen. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on. And what kind of friend do we have? Yes. Like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's praise him. Come on. Lift your praises to him. I was walking a wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. Come on. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven. And I never been the same. Yeah, Come on now. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am, I am a child of love. Yeah, I, I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. The sting of the fire And you saw me in the flame Just when I thought it was over You blow me out of the grave yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love Yes, I am I got a world of freedom I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. I say yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. I say yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. One more time, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love.
And nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way. How come? Oh, I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. Come on, do it again. Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way. Oh, I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. Here we go. I'm going to climb a mountain. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I am a child of love. I'm going to climb a mountain. I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love, yes I am. I found a world of freedom, I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. Come on, see it again. I'm going to climb a mountain, I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom, I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love, yes I am, yeah. Give me praise tonight. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. Thank you for your presence in this place, Lord God, tonight. Thank you for every man, every individual. These young boys that are here tonight, Father, I thank you, Lord, for raising them. Raising them in your presence, Lord God. I pray, Father, you will forgive me of all my sins and all my unrighteousness, for I am a sinner. Anoint these this, this lips of flesh and blood, Lord God, to speak your holy word. That you will be lifted and praised and glorified. Not man, but only you, Lord God. Have your way, Father, for you are my king. You are our king. I surrender my will to you 100%, Father. I cannot move. I cannot speak without you, Lord God. Thank you. Only your name will be re remembered. Thank you. In the precious holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise one more time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tonight I want to talk to you about messengers, and you, you, you might say, what's that about? Um, see, many folks in, in, in my life, and I'm sure in your life, they will come to you and speak sometimes life, and sometimes they'll speak death. So I want to talk about the different messengers that would come to you, because in reality, uh, I'm not talking about casual conversation, just having fun, or a joke, or talking about the cars, you know, or, or sports. I'm talking about designated messengers that are that for a reason have been brought to you, good or bad, you know, holy of God or demonic. Yeah, to come against you or to uplift you. I want to talk about the different messengers that, that we might be. So stay with me. You know, when we're doing our best to walk as a man of God in Christ, when we're doing our very best, when we're, when we're trying hard on a daily basis to glorify God in every decision we make, as a man of God, we made the decision to follow Christ. If we want, if we want to see the hand of God move, in a, not just in a supernatural way, but that the fruit that he produces through you will remain. Amen. I'm talking about fruit that will remain, brothers. In reality, we know that that's going to take our walk with God, that the anointing is what breaks the yoke of bondage. We know God will move, but let me tell you, there has, for, for us to move that way, there has to be some adjustments made in our personal life. We have to be in a position to allow the Lord to, to make some adjustments in our life, whether we like it or not. Many of us are trying to serve God still the way we're serving God and still wanting to do all the stuff we did in the world. We want to we wanna, we wanna taste of the world, look like the world, feel of the world, participate in the world, but be on church Sunday thinking where everything's great. We have to allow those changes, those adjustments to, make, to take place. And many times when, when, when we acknowledge that, Many times the passage we always reference 
is the potter and the clay, which is awesome. God will make those adjustments. He will take those things out and he will put things in. And he, will, he, will, he, will, he will twist things and he'll adjust. He'll make, he'll make changes. But I'm going to tell you something I've learned in my walk with God. Many times I don't, I'm being I'm be very transparent with you. I might not see the hand of God when those adjustments are being made. But sometimes it's just Pearl making them adjustments. Yeah. I'm like, praise God. We're looking for a supernatural move of God that you experience his presence at the altar, which God can do that as well. But we're waiting for a supernatural move of God. And also, oh, God doesn't change me. I no longer want to smoke cigarettes. Sometimes it's going to be your grandkids saying, that stinks. Why don't you stop smoking? Yeah. Or you might be your kids or, or neighbors or people that know you're a man of God and say, you still cuss? Sometimes it's going to be your wife, your kids, your grandkids, your co-workers, your neighbors that are going to make those adjustments. You see, well, many times we're prideful. We kick and buck because we don't want to receive them adjustments from ungodly folk. We don't want to receive those adjustments from the heathen folk. So you need to be very careful when the adjustments are to be made. Stay with me. The Apostle Paul was one that God used in a mighty, very familiar, God used him in a powerful way. Penned three quarters of the, of the New Testament and God used him in a supernatural way. Literally, the power of God came on this man and he was never the same. But with the blessings of God, the supernatural power that came upon this man, with the evidence of the fruit, the evidence of the power, moving by the power of God, the Holy Ghost power moving through him. People understood the power of God that was moving through him. And God said, even because of that, I need to make some adjustments in you. Because my hand is evident amongst the people, I need to make an adjustment in you. You would think, oh, praise the Lord, as a man of God, everything's great. All I got to do is move forward. I'm not smoking weed no more. I'm not masturbating. I'm not, I'm not doing crazy, stupid stuff. I'm, I'm loving God, and I'm paying my tithes, and I'm helping the homeless, and I'm worshiping. I'm on the team. I'm in leadership, and I got keys to the church. Come on now, oh, that's God. I'm doing real good now. God says, I need to make some adjustments. Stay with me. The Lord blessed him with great revelations. He began to give him visions and dreams. And, 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 and he, be, he began to be used in a, in a powerful, powerful way. And everybody's seen it. I want to read one verse, first of all. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7 only. First, verse number 7. Because it says, to keep me from becoming conceited. I'm reading the NIV. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. The King James Version says to buffet me. Paul did not in reality mention what it actually was. Was it specific about that? However, one thing is for sure. That he was really concerned about this issue. He had a problem with it. And in reality, you'll see he wanted it gone. Facts we know that Paul, which in turn, his name was, uh, uh, it was Saul, then Paul. He was an, uh, 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 an educated Christian prosecutor. He knew, the, he, he, he knew the religious folk. He knew the religious aspects of everything. And, and he, wanted to come, he, wanted, he wanted to persecute and kill Christians. He wanted to imprison them. That way, so he was a fanatical that way. He would, he would, he would threaten, he would literally threaten Christians, anybody he knew. So just stop and paint that picture, that scenario for a minute. That if you make a decision for Christ, they're going to come get you. They're, they're going to snitch on you. They're going to, they're going to, they're, they're going to, they're going to get, they're going to try to get you killed. Let me jump to another scripture, and I'll come back to this in a minute. 
Acts 9, 1 through 6 says this, talking about Saul, before it is the road to Damascus experience. Meanwhile, Saul was still threatening, was still, was still breathing out murderous threats. There it is, against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So then he sees a light, verse number three. As he neared Damascus on his journey, journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse five, who are you, Lord, Saul asked. Remember, Saul had never met Jesus. This was 60, some 60 plus years, I think, of after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, the resurrection. So he had never personally seen or met Jesus that way. So second half of five, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Verse six, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So Saul had an encounter with Jesus and he goes through the process. Now verse 17 says that after he, he, the scales come off his eyes and he's got his vision back, but he didn't just get his vision back. He was able to see after that. Reality came into play, discernment like never before. Seeing with the exact same eyes in the same body. He probably had the same clothes on, the same amount of money in his pockets. The people that knew him knew he was a punk and he was coming against people of God. But now, because he had an encounter with Christ, he sees everything different. Isn't that awesome? To see a totally different so he had an encounter so his name is now Paul and he sees everything different so he's fearless he's preaching the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah and now they're trying to kill him and let me tell you this all happened within about three days maybe to a week this all happened within just a few days still has that letter in his pocket to kill the Christian folk to persecute them and all of a sudden, he's fanatical. He's in, love with, he's in love with the Lord. He had an encounter with him. But as we read in Paul's life, once again, we see that the Lord used him mightily. Wherever he went, miracles took place. The Lord began to give him, once again, these visions of all these future events. But as this man was being used mightily and in a powerful way by God, there was something that was continually distracting him as a man of God. And no matter if he was in the, in, in the synagogue or in the streets laying hands on the sick and praying for folk and raising the dead, proclaiming the gospel, there was something that he was going through that was literally affecting him all the time. And I'll prove it, stay with me. Something that was literally getting under his skin that was literally coming against him to the point that we had to go before God and say, God, you need to do something. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's me. That's us. That's us. Something that continually distracted him, and in reality, according to Scripture, he was distressed by it. He prayed... That it would depart from him. You think as a man of God, as soon as you prayed, boom, it happened. Everything else, he seemed to pray, everything happened immediately. Yeah. And you would think that because he prayed, this man of God prayed, and bam, within a few seconds, done. It didn't happen. Some scholars say it might have been disease. Scripture doesn't say that. It might have been sickness. Scripture doesn't say that. Uh, that it might just have been a certain area of his life which he was struggling with, which, of course, that's part of it. Whatever it may be, it was a problem. Stay with me. I'll explain. It was a problem. As a man of God moving forward, it was a problem, something he was going through. He found him struggling with this issue many, many times. They were, according to Scripture, they were necessities, reproaches, persecution, his weakness that way. But according to Scripture, the passage that I'm giving you tonight... I don't want to assume anything. I want to look at the actual verbiage. I want to look at the actual words that this context of Scripture speaks of. Because we can say sickness and disease, but let's see what the Scripture says. Once again, I'm going back 
uh, with this thing that Paul was most concerned about, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. I'm going to read it again. And I'm just par- I'm kind of paraphrasing. It says, A thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A thorn in the flesh. It does not, the scripture does not say, it does not hint, his bones were broken. He didn't say he had leukemia or cancer, he had lung issues. It didn't say that he was bleeding continuously. It didn't say that he was going blind. It didn't say he had COVID. It didn't say any of that. It didn't say any of those things. But, so a thorn in the flesh is not something you can say, oh, I'm done. You know what the thorn in the flesh is? You've had, you've had a spina, a thorn, a splinter? You know what it is? It's constant. It's constant. The thorn in the flesh, no matter what you do, you can be doing this over here and you touch a thing, it reminds you that it's there. It's continually reminding you in every effort that it's there. You're very careful with that thorn in the flesh Because if you touch it, it reminds you to a greater capacity. So what it is, is constant. But verse 9, the Lord calls it a weakness. Stay with me. The Lord calls, the scripture calls it a witness. So now the second half. First, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Once again, let's go by the verbiage. Let's go with what the word of God said. It says, a thorn in the flesh, which is? A messenger of Satan to torment me. So in other words, a message, a message that is directly from Satan, according to the word of God, directed to Paul specifically. It says message. It doesn't say broken bone. It doesn't say sickness or disease. We can turn it a little bit. I'm not going to do that. A messenger. In other words, the message, the message delivered is affecting me to the point that has become a thorn in my flesh and it is constant. Stay with me. It's constant every day. I can feel it in my sleep. I'm going to jump to something else and I'll come back for a minute. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah got a message from the devil too. Elijah got a message from the devil. When Elijah and all, <clears throat> had all the false prophets of Baal killed, he had them slaughtered. He had them all whooped and beat up and he had them all killed. King Ahab's wife Jezebel heard of it. And she said, ooh, she was demonic. She was. If you look at scripture, she was demonic. That's where they get that. That's where they get that, that, that phrase when they say when a woman is a... I'm just real careful. But <laughs> I almost said it, brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. They always reference it as a Jezebel spirit. Yeah. She was demonic. So when she heard, Ahab's wife Jezebel heard what Elijah had done to the prophets of Baal... She threatened, she sent, the Bible says she sent a messenger. Verse 2. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And let me tell you, that message... That the messenger delivered, a demonic message that the messenger delivered was enough for Elijah to run and hide. Yes, please. It was enough for Elijah to run and hide from God. But you know what Elijah was doing? Think about what Elijah was doing. He ran and hid from God because in reality he was saying, I'm not, this ministry is kicking my butt. It's getting me in trouble. And now they want to kill me. So in reality, the power of God moved through Elijah that way. But as soon as the woman brought a demonic message, he ran. He ran from God. 
to the point to where God had to go find homeboy Hayden. The Lord had to go find this boy. Not that he was lost to God, but the Lord had to go get him. <laughs> you know, the enemy will do everything in his power to convince you to put you in a place of fear. Right in this passage here, that enemy, when he brought the message to Elijah, he was telling Elijah what I'm about to do to you. Hadn't done it. He was telling him what I'm about to do. In other words, the future, tomorrow, later on today, whenever that was, he was telling him about what I'm about to do, which in reality never happened. So it was a lie. It was a lie. The messenger, the demonic messenger, brought a message to intimidate to cause fear, to cause anxiety, to cause panic, to be nervous about it, and it worked. The demonic messenger, the message that the messenger brought, caused that effect on Elijah, and it caused him to run. Stay with me. And because of that, what the enemy do with us, he would do the exact same thing to cause fear and nervousness, anxiety, so we no longer move in what God has called us to do. There's probably a 30 of you in here that God has called you to preach the gospel and for some reason you're not stepping up. There's people in here that God has called you to be an evangelist and you refuse to move. There's some of you that God has called you to start a Bible study in your home for men and you refuse to move. Yeah. You got a message from somebody. You got to stay with me. But sometimes that message in reality will be a message of truth. Stay with me. In Job chapter 1, you're not going to see that in, 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 the, in the screen. Job got some messages too from, from, the scripture says in the Old Testament, from messengers as well. When the devil got permission from God to come against Moses, the first message that, that, that came to him through a messenger, it says, the first one, the messenger is sent to Job and told him that all his donkeys and his camels were dead. Remember, he was a rich man. He probably had thousands of them. The first messenger brought the message and said that your donkeys and camels are dead. It's the truth. Stay with me. The second truth, the second messenger that came with that truth is sent to Job and told him that all his sheep and his servants were all dead. Truth. The third messenger is sent to Job and told him that all his camels were stolen. Truth. The fourth messenger came, is sent to Job and told him that all his sons and his daughters were dead. Truth. Job received messages of truth that was happening right now. The devil will attempt to come against you and tell you a truth to convince you you're not worthy to do what God, what you're, what you're doing, right? You're not worthy to, to, to be calling yourself a Christian. You're not worthy to do what God is calling you to do. You're not capable of that. The enemy will use messengers. He'll use people to try to convince you as proof that God's hand is not on you. That God is not even thinking, God did not care about you. Because what he'll do, he'll give you a truth and say, Look what you're going through. You can't even pay your rent. You, you, you can't even, your mortgage, you can't find a job. And, and it's Christmas and you can't. And God has abandoned you. So what he'll do, he'll bring a sort of truth, which is true. I can't pay my bills. I can't do that. And I am sick. And he'll say, that's why God is not on you. He does not care about you. So the message was truth. But deceptive. Stay with me. This thing that Paul was dealing with was an um, every now and then thing that he would encounter. Nope. It was a constant, constant messenger from Satan to torment Paul all the time. Stay with me. A messenger delivers words. That's what he does. It didn't say a delivery boy. He didn't deliver a bullet. Say, this is for you. A messenger delivers 
messages. Stay with me. If the Lord was allowed, was to allow a messenger directly from Satan to come against you with words, what would that messenger tell you? What do you feel that he would tell you to attempt to discourage you and from what you know God has already called you to do? Or let me say it like this. What is that message that the enemy has already been telling you? That has convinced you to not step up in where God has called you to be. What is that message? One of the greatest tools, one of the greatest messages that the enemy uses to keep us from moving forward is our past. Mm -hmm. The people that we have hurt, the ugly things we have done, it's hard to shake that. It's hard to shake that stuff that we did to our family or to those women or to those men, to those children. It's hard to shake that. And the enemy will say, you see? And just the other day, you say God has forgiven you about that. And you were dwelling on that same memory for about 20 minutes. You were thinking about that thing for about 20 minutes. And you say that God has delivered you from it. The enemy will come against you with your past like, like crazy, especially when, you see, when, when, when he sees that you're beginning to move. You're allowing God to, to make some changes within you that way. He'll begin to remind you of those things that were done to us. Those things that hurt us, those things that were done to us. He'll begin to remind you of those things. He will remind you of those things that we have been trying all our lives to forget. To literally not remember anymore. We can be walking straight up with Christ in full-fledged fellowship. Doing our best to be obedient in the things of God. In the discernment and the anointing of the Lord. And the enemy will literally send a messenger directly to you. And he'll say, how in the world do you think you can be walking with Jesus like that when you're still rubbernecking that thing every day? How can you say you're still, you're a Christian when you've been rubbernecking that thing every day. You'll see, you were rubbernecking that thing not even 45 minutes ago. And right away, we, we want to hide because it's a truth. It's not a lie. That part's not a lie. So the enemy will use that truth to get us to back off and say, you know what, I'm not going to do it. I am not worthy. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going not, not to do that. Acts chapter 9. Before he met Jesus, Saul was still, once again, I read the scripture, he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul would use those words to frighten people, to keep them silent about Jesus, to no longer bring forth the gospel, to not get disciples, to not tell anybody about Jesus. He would use those threats. The design was to keep the apostles um, uh, that way. In, in, in fear that they will not move in, in, in the power of God. They will, they will keep quiet because maybe being a friend of being killed and their family that way as well. Verse 7 said that Paul had not yet attained. Neither was he perfect yet. Stay with me. And yet he was in danger of being lifted up with pride. Because God used him in a great way. Paul knew that this messenger was from the enemy. But yet he didn't say, ah, oh, devil, come on, what else you got? He didn't say, devil, what else do you got? No, instead he pleaded to the Lord that he would remove it, from, that it would depart from him, that the Lord would take it from him. It says thrice, the King James Version Bible, anybody says three times he went to the Lord to take it from him, that this thing had been overwhelming him. And the Lord did not answer him up front that way. He didn't say yay and he didn't say nay. God didn't tell him no, but he didn't tell him yes either. God began to use words. He didn't bless him with a special gift after that. God just used words to get him to see it differently. He was telling him, 
After this conversation, you and I'm paraphrasing. After this conversation, this walk, after this conversation is done, you're going to go back to the exact same mess. You're going to still have that thorn in the flesh, but by now, it's probably infected. You're going to go back to the same bills. You're going back to the same job. Your wife is acting cuckoo. You're still going back to that. You're, God didn't say, oh, you know what, man of God? I've seen your faithfulness, and I've seen the lives that I have changed through you. Thank you. Bam! I didn't do that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. He says, for my power. Watch this. He doesn't say for my power is perfect in weakness. He said, my power is perfect. Made. <laughs> he says, it is made. In other words, the power that I have already placed in you. The spirit that rose Christ from the dead that dwells in you. He says, I'm about to take it and bring it to a whole other revelation in your life. He says, because of that mess, because of the thorn. He says, my power is made perfect. Let me mess you up. It doesn't say my power is made perfect with the fasting. It doesn't say my power is being made perfect in prayer. It didn't say that. It doesn't say my power is being made perfect by how you bless the homeless. It says my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh my God. <clears throat> what do you mean? How is God's power made perfect? Through weakness. Many folks, when they're at their weakest point, they run. Many folks, when they're in their weakest point, they pull back. Instead of trusting God. Elijah was a man of God. God used him in a great way too. It was evident that God's hand was upon him. But as a man of God, he pulled back. He ran in fear. Because of the messenger. You see, as a child of God, we're going to go through a bunch of mess. We're going to go through difficult times. We're going to go through weaknesses. We're going to go through difficulties. But every time we put Christ up front, <laughs> while we're in the middle of this weakness, while we're in the middle of the mess, that right there is when we become overcomers. When you call upon the Lord, when you put him up front, right then and there is when we have become Overcomers, but still, real quickly for time's sake. Many times we don't understand how this is done, so let's see what Paul did. I'm going to go quick. Verse 9. This is what Paul did, because sometimes we don't understand how to do this. Paul said, verse 9, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. See, ben, Paul began to use words to talk, to boast about his weakness, that God would be glorified, not man. So that Christ's power, watch this, may rest on him. That's crazy. The whole pivotal point is about the weakness. How you use it. How you speak of it. How to glorify God through it. God says, because of that, my power is being perfected in you. And my power is going to rest on you. Because of how and what you do with this mess, the weakness that you're going through. That's crazy. Verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, now, now he understands something. Just a few, two, three verses before that, Lord, take it. Now verse 10, that is why now, for Christ's sake. It doesn't say, I tolerate the weakness. He says, for Christ's sake, 
I delight. Oh my gosh. He's not saying I'm tolerating it. He goes, I delight in it. He had understanding now that because of this weakness, how we use it, he goes, God's about to do something crazy in me. He goes, so you know what he found? He found a source. He found a vein, so to speak. Spiritually, he says, I thought that this weakness was an attack. I thought that this stuff I was going through was, was, the, was the, because I was a... And now that God spoke to him, that message, he realized something. He said, oh my God, I've had it wrong all this time. I had it wrong all this time. He says, now I delight in it. God did not give him anything extra. God just said, the grace that I put inside of you. He goes, the grace that I put inside of you. He says, take that grace that I placed inside of you and take that weakness. Take that thorn, take that issue. Begin to proclaim God. He said, therefore, I take pleasure. I delight in weaknesses. Watch this. Second half of 10. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, that's crazy. It says then. That's crazy. What do you mean? When I'm weak, then I am strong. <laughs> Because I understand something now. I've seen the vein of gold. I, understand. I see it now, man. I had it wrong this whole time. And Paul came to a whole new revelation. So now he did not look in closing. He did not look at this something that holds him back. He looked at it as something that he's going to be able to use that is inside of him to overcome all this mess. Because remember, God had already used him in a great way. But now all the stuff he was going through is going to be totally different for him. So imagine how God began to use him in a mighty way. It's not by your strength or your might, but it is by his strength. Let me give you the last few scriptures and I'm going to be done with this. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. You're not saying a few or some stuff. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. First John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in me, in you, than he who is in the world. This very moment right now, you may be going through the craziest time, the craziest struggle. But if you trust in the Lord, if you put him up front, if you call upon God in your most difficult time, Watch how that weakness is going to begin to strengthen you inside supernaturally like you've never experienced in your life. Amen. I'm done. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. I'll go quickly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Like I always say, not reverence to man, but to the spirit of the living God that's in this place. I don't believe in begging anybody, neither does the Lord. The gift of salvation is so powerful, it's so great. People should run to that. But I know not everybody's where I'm at. Not everybody's where you're at. But as I always say, tomorrow's not promised to anybody. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you did it one time, but you're not sure where you stand right now. If you know that you need Jesus, come to the front right now. I want to pray with you. Come to the front. Come on. Come on. Here they come. Come on, come to the front. If you know you need Jesus, come to the front. Come on, praise the Lord. Come on. Quickly, if you know you need Jesus, come to the front. Come on, here they come, here they come. Come on. The rest of you brothers, come on. You know, the, you know, you know what we do. Get behind you, brother. We're going to pray for them. Come on. Those of you who need Jesus, come to the front. Let them up in the front. Come on. Start praying. Those of you up front, it's, it, it's a personal relationship between you and the Lord. Start praying. Start glorifying him. Come on. All you brothers need to touch his brothers. Everybody join shoulders, join hands, join arms, whatever you got to do. You, you hear me say, the Lord tells me to do that. He, he needs everybody joining as one. I need everybody touching somebody. Come on, come on quickly. Come on, just, just join shoulders, whatever you got to do. There's power. There's power in numbers. We become a force to be reckoned with. We become spiritual soldiers, spiritual warriors when we come together. 
when we come together in the name of Jesus, coming in agreement. So as you're praying, it's important that you come in agreement that what's about to happen now, God's going to be glorified, that Jesus gets all the praise and all the glory. It's important that we all come in agreement right now that the healings that are going to take place right now, he's going to get the glory. He's going to, we, it's important that we come in agreement that when the cancer is healed, Jesus is going to be glorified. It's important that we come in agreement that when the marriages are restored, he's going to be glorified. The backslider will return. Lives will be changed and names will be placed in the Lamb's book of life. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we come before you right now, Lord God. Thanking you for your goodness and your grace, your love and your mercy, Father. Thank you for your word, Father, that is alive, Father. Thank you for the privilege you have given us to be able to breathe because as long as we have breath in our lungs, Father, we're in a position of your mercy and your grace. There is hope, Father, as long as we're alive. Salvation is availed to us, is made available to us, Lord God. Thank you, Father, for that gift. For those of you that came for salvation, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. For the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. This very moment, I confess I am a sinner. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for receiving me, for accepting me, for placing my name in your Lamb's Book of Life. I'm making a decision from this day forward to serve you to follow you. Use me for your glory and for your honor. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hold on. Stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. Keep praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, keep joining arms. Keep joining shoulders. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now, Father, against all sickness and disease right now, Father. Come on, gentlemen. Come in agreement. Come in agreement. Come on, come in agreement, come in agreement. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we bind all sickness and disease, cancer, we command it to be gone, anxiety, depression, blood issues, lung issues, brain issues, schizophrenia, nervousness. In the name of Jesus, we command it to be gone, pain in the legs and the back, Stomach issues, bowel issues, Lord God, colon cancer, testicular cancer, in the name of Jesus. It's gone in the name of Jesus right now, Lord God. Marriages will be healed, Father. Restoration of marriages and children, Lord God. We bind all those foul spirits that are hindering our teenagers, Lord God, where the enemy's trying to send a messenger to them to take their lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I pray that the Holy Ghost will encamp around them, Lord God. Cover them and protect them, Father. Raise these men as instruments, Father, as vessels that you will fill and that they will pour out, Lord God. Every single day you would have to refill them again, Lord, constantly because they will be pouring out of your blessing, Father, as rivers of living water that flow from our bellies. Lord God, thank you for these miracles that you will be lifted and praised and glorified as we're dismissed tonight. Dismiss us with your grace and your mercy and your love. In the blessed, holy, sanctified name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Gentlemen, you dismiss in the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Greet one another in the Lord.